Someone yeah. tells me. Yeah. Yeah. We um we homeschool our three children. That's a loose oh. term for what it is. They learn at home. <laughs> Whatever that means. Yeah. Like yesterday we processed the sheep. Today we process chickens. Tomorrow we're gonna break some draft horses. It's different okay. every day, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, but it, having this little outdoor shed is wonderful because now I, I they get to be in it. they get to be inside and they can run around and scream and drive my wife nuts. But oh. nobody has to keep them quiet when I'm on oh. interviews like this. So how how old are they? They are three, five, and six. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're on the uh, opposite end of life. Um, yeah. And it's exciting. And at the same time, I don't know, I, a little bit nerving, unnerving to me, looking at the world that we progress into. Yeah. And at the same time, I don't know, children like them give us great hope. Mm. So... Yeah. Anyways, I have I have grandchildren now, so <laughs> I have one son and two grandchildren. That's wonderful. How old are your grandchildren? Uh, they are uh, eleven and fourteen. Wow! Con congratulations! Congratulations! Um, before we get in, it Gunner or Gunnar? How do you, how do you say this? In in Swedish, Gunnar, which is Gunnar. Neither of them, but uh, Gunnar is maybe Gunnar is maybe easier. Uh, when I I worked a lot in Africa, I ended up calling myself Ghana, like the country. That was easiest for them to 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 remember, so to say. And otherwise, Gunners is the um, the nickname for the football team of Arsenal. Okay. So, and it it has the same root. I mean, it means the same. Gunnar is a name that means the same as gunner in English, uh, which is an old word for somebody who's manning a, a fighter of some kind, uh, manning a gun. I see. Or a cannon, probably, in the old times, I would guess. I see. Does, does, word, yeah. does your name reflect your life? No, no, I wouldn't in any say way. so. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> it doesn't... I, it no. doesn't it doesn't seem like that. Well, it's a, oh. a, a privilege and an honor sitting with you. I have uh, been thinking about this conversation for a while now. I've read through um, none of your books in totality, but I flipped through many of them. I have many notes. I have recently re-dove into your writings on Substack. Um one of the pieces uh, I think it was written in June, all about cows and limits and capitalism and markets. I, I really. Yeah, I think it was after that one you contacted me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was after reading that. Um, there's there's just something, you know, and and maybe we can just start here. Yeah. Um, in, in, in one of your books, Garden Earth. Um, yes, that sounds right. Um, in the introduction, you talk a lot about the progression from hunter-gatherer societies, um, or I believe you call them capture societies. Uh, yeah, in a way, uh, foraging or capturing societies, because the hunting thing is maybe a bit overdone. Mm. I mean, uh, basically, well, many of them were hunters or fishermen, but the foraging or collection of or wild crops and, and stuff was also very important in many of those. So I think it's as a we are sometimes a bit misled by the hunting thing, which mm. is more more macho and uh, of course very symbolic and, and was important for sure. Uh, but still, uh, also a lot of life I think was just you know collecting root root crops or fruit crops or whatever crops there were depending on where you were or or or, or shellfish or stuff like that which is of course a kind of hunting or fishing but it's also collection of stuff right right and, and and you write that you know we obviously this is not a linear narrative but the question is going to make it seem so so i apologize but you you write that out of this capture or collecting society, this hunter-gatherer narrative, um, you know, agriculture sprang up to some degree as like a stabilizing force, potentially, but it immediately felt unstabilizing. 
like when we become agricultural to some large degree, we become unstable. Um, and I wanted to investigate that with you. And I think the conversation is naturally going to progress, at least as I anticipate. And who knows what that means? Often these conversations progress in an entirely new direction. We don't get to talk about anything that I prepared for, uh, but to limits. And I want to talk yeah. about limits and capitalism and markets. And then I think as I see it, and again, we'll see what happens, but progress that conversation from limits to relationship and morality and kinship and this connection between earth and our earthlings and uh, some of your more, you know, very recent thoughts. Mm. And so that, that's, that's my idea for this conversation. Yeah, we'll see where reasonable. it goes. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's talk about the stability. So capture or gathering societies progressing into agriculture it's both stabilizing and unstabilizing. Let's explore that together. What, what do you? What, what was your intention in, in bringing that up, especially as it came to modern machines and fossil fuels as they relate to agriculture, and how might that evolution in the human tool set or in the human worldview or paradigm, you pick how you want to explain that, mm -hmm. how, how might that be simultaneously stabilizing and unstabilizing? Yeah, I think that's it's in a way we we uh, it's about control and our uh, our society or humans have tried to control things for a long time uh, and uh, agriculture is of course uh, I would say a, a step towards much higher level or degree of control than hunting is although I must say. Uh, that already when I wrote that book, which was now, well, 13 years ago, I think I made the case for that maybe the the uh, rupture between the old and the new wasn't that particularly clear. And I think my thinking has also advanced even more there that, you know, with the, the step from hunting and gathering or collecting stuff to agriculture was maybe very much a very slow process and it was actually not even a linear pro progress in one direction. Some societies even went back and forth between that. For right. instance, that has been studied, studied in Sweden that agriculture for a while shrank back again because of climate change and stuff like that. Anyway, but largely we could say that uh, also with hunting and gathering, uh, humans try to control things, you know, they burnt landscapes and stuff to facilitate hunting or, or to promote grazing uh, animals and stuff like that. And with uh, agriculture, we increase that degree of control, at least over that particular part of land that we farm. Now I talk specifically about crop farming. Of course, you have the parallel development with the pastoralism and stuff like that, which is slightly different, I would say, although it still has something to do with control, but it's more, pastoralism is more adapting to changing circumstances because pastoralists realize that they are not in control. Farmers kind of believe <laughs> or want to believe that they are in control. <laughs> But anyone who has been actually farming also know that 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 is not entirely true either. Anyway, we try to control things. And of course, that has progressed to our current society where we actually are uh, excelling in, in uh, control in all kinds of aspects. But control also means increasingly uh, unstable conditions and fragility and star complexity, which, you know, well, I, I'm sure you heard about these theories about the uh, collapse of complex societies and stuff like that. And it's not only complex societies, it can be all kinds of systems that are, you know, you try to fix them and then you add on another controller right, uh, and another layer and another layer. And, and at some point, the whole construction is is not stable any longer, and you you don't under even understand it. So I think agriculture is a lot about that, and of course it has also nurtured the idea that we are indeed in control. I mean, okay, even exaggerated by writings of the Bible and stuff like that, where humans are seen as as the crown of the creation or something like that, the head of the creation. And uh, and with uh, enlightenment and modernity jumping ahead, 
we we get to a yet another stage where we really try to understand all the rules governing the world and, and manipulating them and controlling them. We talk about laws of nature and stuff like that. And, and uh, we, of course, understand that we can't change those laws, but we can uh, use them to our uh, uh, gain, so to say. That, that's kind of how I see it. I must say, having said that, that there is... Uh, I don't totally subscribe to the idea that agriculture was was a big failure and, and you know uh, the the fall of man more or less you know we were happy as long as we were uh, foragers or hunters and then we right. became uh, uh, desperate poor and and, uh, <laughs> and the hierarchical and patriarchy and all that stuff with agriculture. I don't know if you you're familiar with David Greber and, and I am. Yeah, and I read his uh, and uh, Wengro's David Wengro's book, The Dawn of Everything, or something. I think that's called. correct. Yep. Uh, well, well, they also try to show that this linear thinking is is a bit too simplistic. Although I know they have had a lot of criticism from scholars about how they relate that story. I still I still look up some of the points there as I think are quite valid that even right. within the agriculture system, within the hunter and gatherer system, there are plenty of options for being cruel and, uh, and authoritarian and there are plenty of options to be libertarian or, or freer in, in the mind. But I also think that agriculture has been very much linked to the to the great civilizations. The narrative on agriculture has been very much linked to, you know, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Chinese, the Romans, and and the situation of farmers within these large civilizations. And mostly they were actually quite poor. They were maybe quite safe because the, the, the state kind of guaranteed them uh, food. They had huge storages and stuff like that, but they had to deliver so much of their production to the state, but not only the production, also their manpower and stuff like that. So right. the fact that they were poor it doesn't necessarily reflect the uh, the true nature of being a small farmer or a peasant and stuff like that. The collapse of the Roman Empire was maybe a, a tragedy of a, of a civilization, but I'm not sure it was a tragedy for peasants in France or in northern Italy or in Spain. <laughs> so there's no evidence that they were harmed by this, so to say, this collapse. Right. Yeah, that's it. so much there. I mean, this idea of globalism. I was in a conversation recently with a fellow where I was making the claim that his entire viewpoint has to exist post to the idea of a true globalistic society, that what he was arguing was only able to be manifest because we've so well accepted and purchased this globalistic narrative. Mm -hmm. And so when we, my point is when we look back at history and we see the fall of the Roman Empire, let's say, whatever it was, 400 AD, yeah. you know, we think the whole world, you know, mm -hmm. gave a rat's ass about it. Like they, mm -hmm. the whole world was just affected by it. Yeah. You know? it's yeah. like, well, the only reason we can believe that is because we live in a globalistic society today. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously is not the case. I, I wonder, have you read, um, you know, equally, you know, people pick on on this book, uh, similar to The Dawn of Everything, Graeber and, and Wengro's book, in a, from a totally different perspective. But have you read Rebecca Costa's uh, The Watchman's Rattle, I believe? No. It's, no, I haven't. It's, it's one of those books um, that if you read the introduction in the first chapter, like you'll you'll understand the book. Um, but it's still a very worthwhile spend mm -hmm. of time. Anyways, I, I want to, dive into this because what you're getting at is she writes that there is a particular that that civilizations or empires or peoples fall uh, because what she calls the cognitive threshold that we have that the created systems the human created systems so like agriculture particular forms of political life or governance or society whatever it is let's just say agriculture for now that the created systems the human created systems evolve out of pace with biological systems I mean, it's yes. it's really simplistic and is obviously a lot more nuanced to thing. But I wonder, because when you look at the archaeology, I just published a book earlier this this summer, later this spring, I should say. And uh, in one, one aspect of the book, I was looking at some recent studies in 2018 and 2019 
of this international team of archaeobotanists that discovered really the existence of uh, crop agriculture in the Jordanian River Valley uh, at about 23,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that that's outrightly interesting in its own way. It just shows complexity and nuance, and it's wonderful. Obviously, people pick on their science as well. Uh, but it has only been corroborated and re-corroborated since 2018, you know, all the way till today. But something that's interesting is agriculture, like you're saying, doesn't seem to be evil, but a con entirely machine-based, controlled, and mechanized system of agriculture in the absence of any other methodology or, or paradigm, mm. it, it does seem to build upon a certain worldview of this like settler colonial, this dominant, you know, this mm. very controlling human species. Mm. What do you think about that? Like, is it? Well, I, I, I agree. <laughs> a lack of nuance, yeah. Yeah, well, I agree. And, and I, I think the, uh, the uh, transformation of agriculture into commodity farming is underpinning this. I mean, it's a bit of a question of what is the driving force if it's the, the technology or if it's the market but I, I think they go hand in hand and together with fossil fuels as well these the, this trinity the market the technology and the fossil fuels they are together a very very strong system that has moved us away from self-correcting natural systems which are were mainly locally based for local use uh, where you know uh, natural processes like uh, circulation of nutrients, etc., were more or less self-evident. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> you don't need to. And uh, I mean, the notion of sustainability was was apparent. It was nothing that you you didn't need that word at all. And in most small farm, <laughs> I mean, not that they were interested in that kind of abstract words anyway, but it's also, you didn't need right. it. It was sustainable. I mean, the whole, I don't say that all farming systems have been sustainable, but by and large, those small scale farming systems that were established and, and where you get self-correction over centuries. I mean, you can't compare that to where, you know, European settlers, diving into the American prairies and starting a, or Australia, exporting their own agriculture system and, and you know, expanding it ridiculously and, and not having that, yeah, never worked in that system. I've seen that in other countries also with the right. uh, people migrating, for instance, uh, uh, people from the Andes moving down to the rainforest in, in uh, Peru. Well, they make a mess of the whole thing because their farming system was sustainable and good where they lived. But when they move, uh, you know, not very far, but to a totally different climate, they make a mess of it. Anyway, my point is that that previously traditional agriculture system were had so many self-correcting features, both ecological but also social. I would say, you know, that that kind of limited what you could do. You most uh, a lot of land were, uh, were in commons, for instance, were not privately owned, uh, which means that the grasslands and the forests were almost always, at least in Europe, in communal use, and, and people had to agree on how to use them. Um, and and well, they, all this changed with the commodification of agriculture, which is a rather late thing, which is actually, in developing countries, has only been going on for 70, 80 years, full scale. Of course, there were early plantations of, of uh, commercial crops already 150 years by the English uh, with tea and coffee and uh, oil palm started later. But anyway, cotton, uh, for instance, a typical plantation crop uh, that has been expanding in, in, uh, in the tropics. So, so a lot of agriculture was, was self-correcting, sustainable in many ways. And with the impulse of fossil fuels, industrialization and markets, and even more than global markets, as we speak, uh, this changed a lot. And agriculture has become, uh, I would say, a, a rather destructive force without, uh, <laughs> you, you can't say anything else. Right. I mean, uh, as in general. Right. Well, let, let's, I want to, at the beginning of that stay, I have two different ways that the conversation uh, can unfurl here, and maybe we'll go both ways. But the, the first, I want to focus on this idea of markets. 
uh, you've written on this, and so I, I believe I, I know your heart on the subject, but I'm going to ask like I don't, so that you can unfurl that for the user or for the for the listeners. Um, but like the capitalistic narrative is that markets are self-correcting mm. because of consumers. Mm. Is, is is this so? And if this is so, then it seems like agriculture and our mechanization or commodification of nature through agriculture is fine. And if it is not so, I think it needs to be questioned. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I must say uh, it, it's especially the uh, my experience in farming, both in Sweden and in other countries, is is made me question the logic of this narrative. I think the uh, the market logic and the capitalist logic of self-correction uh, through markets is correct within its own narrative, so to say, within its own rules. But it it behaves as there is nothing outside that system. Uh, but when there is something outside that system, it's not very self-correcting anymore. So, I mean, climate change, environmental pollution, uh, even exporting social problems to other parts of the globe is, is part and parcel of uh, capitalism. And there is, okay, some people then think that the solution is to get all that stuff into the market system. Uh, you know, you, you put price on carbon, you, you make ecosystem services as tradable goods, etc., etc. Uh, I, I don't think that is a, a, a very successful um, avenue, actually. And I think in the long, in the short term, it's, it's a band-aid for capitalism or something they can show. But in the long term, it just means that we move out the boundaries, but there will always be new boundaries and things that are not self-correcting in the system. And in addition, it means that we are we are including even larger part of the planet in the market. I mean, so far the air is not a marketable commodity. Water is only partly a marketable commodity, uh, you know, and biodiversity is not in general a marketable commodity and I don't think they should be marketable commodities in my view and maybe we come back to that also in the end of our conversation I think the trick is rather to move more things out of the market again but <laughs> not to refute uh, the logic of capitalism because it's not working very well it's not even I would say very efficient within its own context although I can I can buy the arguments if you look at markets in a very isolated uh, way yeah i was uh looking at your substack while you were speaking but cows capital and growth is the title yeah. <laughs> of the uh of the wonderful article that speaks a lot i think to what you were just uh elucidating for us it's on your pod or your podcast your substack beyond sustainability I'll put a link in the show notes um but in it there's just one you, you you almost take us through a thought exercise as you're working to make the decision or or not on whether or not to expand the food producing capacity of your landscape mm. and to you know spoil the story for everyone but at the end you conclude that if you were to expand you would reach a new limit like your current limits are your limits yeah. if you were to expand you would reach a new limit and you investigate all of the opportunities of those limits more land that also you know that you control that also means that there's less land for other people there's less land in the commons there's less land for x y like it's that's one limit but also your human capacity to run that new land is also now a new limit and then you also talk about increasing import of um you know uh, feeds and more hay and other things and you say how that's identical to this idea of just farming more land because you're taking the resources from the land that you're not farming and you bring them in and it's just money and market yeah. and capitalism that allows you to do that. Because often that's not coming from your neighbor's land. That's coming from, you know, yeah. plains of Ukraine where all mm. of the potash is is is, is mined and, and created. You get my point. It's coming from other areas of the world. And uh, and so this this idea of limits that when we break the limit, we run into a new limit once again. Mm -hmm. To me, this illustrates two things. The first thing is that limits are implicit in our operations. And you write about this in, in your book, Garden Earth. Mm -hmm. Even in the intro that I brought up initially, you write about this idea that um, there's an intrinsicness to 
there's an intrinsicness in life, in a natural life, whatever that is, if it's agricultural or the hunter-gathering type societies that maybe preceded it, maybe co-evolved with agriculture, whatever the actual reality is, there's an intrinsicness of that life of limits. And, and you can't get around that. And we have to start understanding what that means. So that's, that's maybe number one. But number two is, I think so much of the arguments that could be raised maybe against you know, some of the thoughts you raise in the books, you know, or even in this conversation is that agriculture needs to increase its production power to feed the world. Mm. And what you're saying is, as I understand it, so correct me, and this is, I guess, a question. So are you saying that if we were to continually increase the production uh, of food in the agricultural systems, that we're going to continually rely on things that continually make us less stable? So in search of stability, we become unstable. That that seems to be like the natural limit. Mm. Yeah, it captures it quite well, and I and I must say that the this, you know, I've been a proponent of organic uh, farming since 1977, and been very much engaged in this. And and the standard argument against organic farming has always been, you know, you can't feed the world, and uh, and. And I worked a lot with developing countries uh, as a consultant to help small farmers and, and stuff like that. And, and this global narrative of food shortages to begin with just, uh, it's just very, it's a myth, you know, the, the per capita production of, uh, you know, of agriculture has increased to one and a half, two times since 1960. So the fact that people are starving or people are hungry are, are really not at all something to do with the, that production is too small. And what has happened is instead that agriculture raw materials are increasingly used for bioenergy and also that we, we or we, but <laughs> that food industries have uh, increasingly used crops that could be used as human food uh, for uh, feed to chicken and pigs in particular, to some extent also to cattle in American feedlots. Although if you look at the statistics, it's actually a very small share of the cattle or the beef or the milk in the world that is produced with uh, mainly with uh, uh, human food crops, while for chicken and pigs, it's a very huge share. Anyway, so that's a sign of overproduction. And also as a farmer, active farmer, you can just look at the prices of farm crops to realize that the, the problem is not that there is too little products because if, if there were, the prices would be much, much higher. So this idea that we have to increase production or productivity is, is it's just not true. Having said that, there is also the other mechanism that increased food production and the affordability of food has certainly been a, a very helpful component to increase human population. Uh, and we can't look away from human population as one factor. I mean, the, the sheer size of the human population is problematic. I, I don't think that it's still so big that it makes our situation totally desperate, but for sure, uh, to continually increase the human population is not a very sustainable <laughs> way to develop human civilization. It can't be dependent on an ever-growing population. So the, the enormous increase in productivity of agriculture has certainly made number of humans higher. I mean, for all other animals, we are quite okay to understand that, especially if there are no predators, and we have very few predators except for COVID and, and those small ones. Uh, so all other animals, we accept the idea, okay, there is more food, there will be more animals. So the same logic actually applies to us as well. Uh, and we should be a bit careful of not expanding our numbers and we should not making expanding agriculture production as a, as a purpose of its in its own. I think it's not... It's not I'm, not, I'm not a fan of, you know, dramatic rewilding, locking humans out of nature. I think we can live in nature, but even when we live in nature, like with our grazing cows, we don't capture so much from the land. We, we certainly capture a lot more calories from the land by growing potatoes or wheat from a piece of land. But then 
from that piece of land, we lock everything else out, or at least we try to do that. Uh, from the grazing cattle, we can do that in coexistence with a lot of other species that actually many of them thrive and, and are even better off when our cattle graze there and if there were no cattle. Anyway, maybe I'm uh, distracting here a bit. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I, th I think uh, <laughs> what, what, what I'm understanding here is that this, there's an interesting, interesting level of control that I think humans feel like we need. Well, at the same time, it is interesting because it is that same level of control that is to some degree uh, reducing our potency over mm. the landscape and, yeah. and over our own integration and kinship with yeah. that same landscape. Yeah, I, I think that's why where some of your ideas that I, I must admit that I haven't studied the wealth of what you have written and said and, 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 and so, but I understand that you also are into that line of thinking that we must let go of some of our <laughs> control of, the, right. of well, the system. It 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 just does yeah, it just seems like there's a strange um it's just a strange servitude to this idea of power and, mm -hmm. and control. And mm -hmm. and it's just this 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 complex narrative that through you know increasing that control we can stabilize the life that we have mm -hmm. which automatically dismisses a couple of fundamental assumptions. Number one, is that even possible? Number two, and I think, you know, this might be a, a train or a particular, you know, thread that we can, we can weave in this conversation, but like, why, why would we want to control our way into a more solidified human dominated world? Mm. You know, like why, why is that what we're looking for? Um, yeah. But also, you know, three, something that my writing and, and to some degree, some of the, things that I've studied over the past couple of years is like uh, food waste. I've just, mm. it, it's, it's paralyzing. Like you're, mm. you're bringing up these numbers, you know, one, one and a half, two times the food production since 1960, you know, we're taking, last time I checked, it was 47% of the corn grown in the Southeast of the United States today, which is not high corn country, but it's everywhere. Yeah. It's not central, you know, Turtle Island, Western hemisphere here, but it, it's mm. pretty, it's pretty dominant. 47% of that, I think it was this was 2017, goes to uh, biofuels and cattle alone. Mm. Yeah. I can't now, now we have a lot of cattle here. Yeah, but, I know. But you bring up pigs and in, 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 in pork. I'm sorry, uh, pigs and chicken. chicken. Yeah. And uh, it, it's interesting. My mom, she raises these very low, if, no, if not no input, free range chickens that we process mm. once a year. And that was this morning. We processed some some birds this morning, and and we were talking about the process and how, you know, long it takes for such little, you know, mm. bits and pieces of meat and, and nourishment, mm. you know. But you you harvest a cow or you harvest a goat or a sheep, and it takes less time, and you get exponentially more meat. And mm. we were just joking with each other that you know, there's this quote, Jean Jacques Rousseau, the uh, Enlightenment or anti Enlightenment thinker, depending on how you read them. Uh, 18th century, he makes a joke that uh, whoever was the first human to block off a parcel of land and say, this is mine, mm. and then everyone else around him believed him. Yeah. Like, yes. like that, that, that is the original stand-up comedy. Mm. Like that, that is yeah. the comedic moment of the human experiment. Mm. And uh, we made a, I made a comment in, in regard to that, and everybody was laughing in the barn we were processing. Um, it was even like previous to the sun rising. And I was just joking, like whoever looked at a chicken and said, we can mass produce this. Yeah. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Because poultry and even pork, right? These are lone animals. These are raised in small batches. They're hard to process. They're hard to render down. They're yeah. hard to, you know, process into food stuff. Yeah. Why are we concentrating so much on species that provide so little and then complaining when it takes so much input to create such a little output? Yeah, no. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a comedy. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I, I think when I, on, on your points there about control, I think uh, initially my concern was more, you know, I'm, I'm raised in a kind of a scientific environment. My father was a professor at the university and uh, we, you know, we all admired big scientists and stuff like that. And I, I ran my chemistry lab in the garage and stuff like that and thought I would be a great uh, uh, scientist. Uh, but in the end, 
I, I first lost faith in our ability to control, I think it was with nuclear power, actually, when I realized that, you know, that was very sophisticated. And then shit happens. Okay, so <laughs> not so many of them have, have uh, uh, you know, capsaicized, but it, it's enough, so to say. But then I, I realized that this control is, is to a large extent, an illusion. But lately, I'm also getting more and more, you know, intrigued by the fact that even if we could, it's not desirable. It's it's a boring uh, attitude. It's a boring life. By trying to control, we also undermine so many things that gives us joy and pleasure and you know wonder uh, of the wonders of the world, so to say. As soon as we try to control it, it's no longer fun. You know, it's it's no longer interesting everything that we try to uh, tame and standardize and, and control I, I worked a lot with certification in this organic sector because that was one tool that the organic sector developed for uh, being able to go to the marketplace uh, and uh, i spent almost 20 years with developing certification systems and accreditation and inspections and all that stuff and and First, I, I thought it was a very valuable exercise, but lately I got so tired of this idea that, you know, you standardize it. So you just standardize it because you have to, because of the market. There is no other reason for why you would like to standardize a farming methodology or a system like organic. It's just because, and then you standardize it, and then because market forces forces you to also certify it and making it's all oriented to commodity production actually to be sure that your organic apple is the same as my organic apple which is yeah. totally the opposite of where i am today in my mind i'm still organic certified because i started the swedish certification system i can't really opt out it would be, <laughs> I've, I've stuck in it but but you know the, it's it's contrary to my belief that my apple shouldn't be the same as your apple, even if they happen to be of the same variety by coincidence. Uh, I think they are not the same because they are grown in different soils and different climates and different everything. Right. And I'm not you. So uh, I, I think I, I've been moving much towards, towards a, a totally different uh, view on why it's not only not feasible or technically possible to be totally in control, but it's actually no fun and it gives so no joy. And you said in the introduction that we may end up uh, talking about relationships because that's where this comes in also, you know, right. you can't, you can't control people and expect them to be on a, on a mutual level of relationship. Right. Because you are in control and it's the same with us and the rest of the living that as long as we are 100% in control, we all this discussion about, you know, other life forms should have the same rights as us or whatever. It's just, it's just nonsense or bullshit as long as we manage the system totally and we keep it 100% under our control. Wow. Well, you're, Having you're... said that, of course, to just give up all control is as a human is i think also impossible right well it, it's just to misunderstand i think the essence of of what it means yeah because control so. yeah control is just a word um and, and like you said rewilding you know these large rewilding projects that surround your hemisphere you know it's just they're yeah. everywhere over there mm. much smaller over here um we we just have large conservation land and national parks. That's 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 our that's our bane. Um, it 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 looks at control and it says let's do the opposite, mm. and then it also falls into the same traps that I think it was trying to run away from, mm. because a humanless environment is not an environment. It, it it's just a humanless environment, right? As if this wonderful mosaic just had a you know, an aspect of it ripped out and then you still wanted to marvel at its beauty. Well, its beauty isn't there anymore. It's missing an aspect of itself. Yes. And so there's an intrinsic relationship between man and earth, um, between earth and earth, between the trees and earth, between the trees and man. There's a kinship there, a relationship that has to be understood and respected, right? Because if humans started to grow roots, well, that wouldn't make any sense. 
And if trees started to give up their roots and start walking around physically, well, that wouldn't make any sense, right? So there's a oh. particular essence, like a created essence to the idea of life. And so it's not that humans should become something else, but what I'm getting from you and, and what a lot of my work gets to as well is it, it seems like there's a central aspect of our humanity that this industrialized, commoditized agriculture um, and a lot of its strangely uh, ulterior movements today, like like organic, mm -hmm. like organic is to some large degree, like I believe initially, or maybe like regenerative agriculture today would be a finer example. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's it's positioned itself as a in in this narrative as a movement against commoditized agriculture, mm -hmm. but at the same sense, and not this is not that this is uniform in any of these things, organic oh. or regen or even commoditized mm -hmm. agriculture. But to some large degree, it's still based upon the same worldview that mm. humans can dominate our way into a crisis. We can dominate dominate our way out of a crisis, mm. right? We can heal Earth. We can erode Earth, and mm. Earth is just this damsel, you know, in mm. distress, waiting for us, you know, to do good or to do bad, mm. right? And so, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is, it, it seems like number one, what you're saying is we have to start challenging ourselves in this understanding of stability and instability where are the limits like on your landscape mm -hmm. you, you in that article on substack you write that you know one comes in one comes out mm -hmm. your land can only hold so many and, and to some degree that's your processing strategy yes and it's hard and you said in the in the article that you wish you didn't have to process them and they can live out their lives and they continue to continually develop the you know the relationship with the land with you etc but you're not trying to raise more cows. No. Oh. And, and you're not trying to exceed the limits of your system no. because your system oh. has limits. And so mm. where I want to start is so much of kinship or relationship becomes entirely too philosophical too quickly. So let's mm. first ground it. Mm. There is a particular relationship and kinship you have with the land and, it, and its animals that necessitates a particular action or a particular inaction on your part. Well, and maybe we can focus on the cows because that's what the article was written yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Wh whatever, we can focus on your gardens or yeah, well. hay production or whatever. You can focus on what you like. But how, how does that relationship unfurl in the physical world before we get into some of this more philosophical thought? Yeah. Yeah, how does it? Yeah, well, I... I... I, the farm we have now, I, I see the farm as, as a kind of landscape management uh, system or something. So I do try to manage the landscape, but I do see that we have quite a lot of different systems going on in the farm. We have some dense old growth forest. We have a, a peat bog. We have a swamp. We have a lake. We have former agriculture fields that have been neglected for 40 years. We have uh, some meadows and we have, uh, and, and we ha are slowly regenerating, if you could say, the landscape to some extent. We are, we are actually trying to create more um, diversity and more buff uh, border zones and stuff like that. You know, the, of course, there is a beauty in the plains or the ocean or a, a big you know, savanna or something like that. But most of the action in landscapes is in the border between uh, different types of landscapes, different bi biomes, so stuff like that. So borders are uh, inc incredibly important. So we kind of try to increase all these meeting places, uh, both for us, but also for different uh, animals and, and uh, plants and well, all kind of microbes that we have no clue about how many they are and what they do with us or in the soil, <laughs> because they are they are actually the rulers. It's neither we nor the cows or or not even the trees. It's all these these small ones underneath that are will survive long after us. And they were here long before us, and and they are the real uh, sustainable life forms. I think, and, or we are just you know, in the long-term perspective. Okay, now I became very philosophical, left my own <laughs> ground a bit. But in the long-term perspectives, the rest of us, we are only visitors, I think, on this planet compared to the fungi and the bacteria and all these right. 
these guys. They will be there forever. Anyway, so so what we try to do here is is to make a landscape that is also we like to live in, and which is kind of beautiful. I, I think, I mean, beautiful is a very subjective uh, terminology, and I, I guess it's also changes over time. But I do think that aesthetics is a is somewhat of a guide sometimes to what you should do or not do. Is mm. it ugly? Well, then it's probably wrong to do that. <laughs> if the building is ugly, well, don't build it. You know, it's, yeah. It's, well, unless you're in the commoditized system, which yeah, seems to me exactly. to, to prioritize that. But yeah, the, no, the, the commoditized system is is often it's it's framed around ugliness and standardization and right. boxes of. Have you heard this fantastic song of Pete Seeger? Seeger, little boxes. Have you heard that one? No. Oh, try that one. It's it's very it's wonderful. Uh, Anyway, so they we all they all grow up in little boxes, little boxes, all the same. I'm no singer anyway, but uh, so I think if it's beautiful, it's also has some potential for being a nice and functional landscape. And we didn't plan to have cows here. It was the landscape that called for the cows, because when I when we looked for the farm, I actually didn't look for a farm with so much agricultural land. Uh, I thought one hectare, like two and a half acres, would be enough for my vegetables. So plant a few trees and stuff like that. But we we got uh, you know twenty five acres instead, and and uh, pasture land and stuff. And then we said, what should we do with all this land? And, and there had been cows on this land for three, four hundred years, or maybe even more. And so on. Then we we. Uh, we borrowed cows and, and some other person had them over winter and but then he wanted to sell and, and quit farming so then we bought the cows that we had borrowed instead and, and since then they are here and we uh, we learned a lot from the cows i must say i had cattle uh, and goats for 35 years ago on my previous farm and i wasn't much of an animal person i must admit i always been more of a, a plant person and flowers and trees maybe most a uh, tree person but anyway with these cows we started to uh, study them and, and uh, my wife was maybe more pioneer in that than i was um now we discussed why do they do like that why do they do that why do they graze there why don't they like that grass and, and why are farmers taking away the younglings from the older ones and, and why do they wean off the calves when they are six seven months old and send them somewhere um, and why is is the bull not there and stuff like that so we, uh, we because we have so few cows we have only five mother cows and their offspring and we raise the calves and we some of them we slaughter as 10 month old calves some of them are are getting older together and we all keep them as one group and it's actually very nice to see how they uh, how they behave as a group and how they some bond and some hate each other like humans they don't go well together and and some are very strong bonds uh, in the family groups you know with the older cow and her offspring and their offspring they all form a kind of gang so there were many things to study with the cows and we learned a lot from the cows i still think uh, they understand us better than we understand them unfortunately when they tell me something, I'm not sure I always understand so well, but when I tell them, they seem to uh, understand it <laughs> quite well. So I think we we have been on a learning exercise with the uh, with the cattle. In the meantime, also with the farming, the vegetable production, I've been on a learning exercise because of my previous farm. I we, I grow on on coarse, not coarse, but sand, a sandy soil, you know three days without irrigation and the lettuce died more or less. It was really a very low organic matter, very sandy soil. Here I have a very heavy clay with poor drainage. Uh, and, you know, too much water is the constant problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have to relearn farming as well uh, with a totally different uh, soil. Uh, well, yeah, it seems, thinking back to the comment that you made about commodification, yeah. how so much of the 
power and control agriculture demands is not innate to agriculture, but it, it oh. placed upon it from the outside. Yes. It, it, from this commodification. And just thinking about talking to cows and cows talking to us, very little of that has the ability to open, to manifest in a very conventional, commodified uh, system, even that looks for beauty, even that looks for biodiversity. And uh, I, I gave a keynote address at this conference down in Texas a couple of years ago and uh, basically made that point. You know, we're all looking to regenerate the earth, but we're not challenging the, 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 the assumptions or the preconceived notions or the structures that surround our desire for regeneration. And therefore, we can still possibly degenerate earth, you mm. know, to say it very simply mm. and less well, hopefully. Um, and a lot of people got angry about that. Uh, uh. It, it seems like we want to believe that there is a linear narrative to mm. con to defeat linearity. No, I agree. I agree. I, I see that on many proponents of, uh, well, maybe regenerative agriculture or other environmental issues, you know, that people have this desire that there is, okay, we done something wrong, now we do this, and we uh, it's again uh, a method and we will change things and we'll steer it in the right direction. But uh, it's not really, it's not mostly not deep enough. Sometimes it's just bullshit, of course, and greenwashing with no substance, but sometimes <laughs> there is some, well, uh, it's it's a lot, a lot of it, I must say, and uh, especially on the technical level where people have, you know, all these miracle solutions that will uh, precision fermentation or something like that, that will produce food with uh, low, no, low inputs and, uh, and very little environmental footprint. Um, People who promote that may be in good faith, but it's it's for me it's a non-starter actually, and it's yeah. no fun. It's no really not interesting uh, as a human being. Uh, I, I, that's what I even with food. I think uh, a lot uh, a lot of the debate, at least in Europe, around food has been you know how many CO two equivalents is your diet producing and it. And before that, it was how many calories or how many vitamins or how many proteins, you know, right. it's such an instrumental view on food, which is, I mean, food is, that's why I'm also very interested in food and agriculture is, of course, because it's our most immediate and direct relationship with the rest of life is through food. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's how we ingest nature, I would say. It's, it's uh, how we breathe and how we eat and how we drink. That's right. that's how we really relate to, of course, we look at nature as well and we feel the smell and we, we look at the beauty, but really hands-on uh, food is, is extremely important. And this food is reduced to, to an instrument either for, you know, building muscles or for living until you're 130 years old or to reduce your climate footprint. It's, it's all kind of instrumental perspectives on food, while food has all through human history been extremely culturally important. We built societies around food and food production and, and eating. It's itself the, the, you know, the idea of the, the people eating together. It's, it's a very strong uh, feature in all, almost all cultures that you eat together and you, you, you discuss things, you decide things, or you, you just laugh or you have fun. It's, it's all, I mean, that is only left in, in our society, maybe at Christmas and a, a few year, a few party times, because eating today is just a mechanical thing that people do on the fly. They take grabs on fast food and stuff. And, and a problem is not only what's in the cup, I would say, it's, it's also the the process of how you get that food and how you eat it with no consideration, no gratefulness to whatever life, whether it's a plant or, a, or an animal put into that plate, you know, there's no connection to it. You just, something you, you take in. Yeah. I think, you know, people have said it in the, in the past and, and, and I'm starting to question this. I think it's close, but not on, you know, we talk about a commoditized system 
food system producing commoditized consumers. But I wonder if it's the commoditized consumers not wanting to reconcile the life of the food system that demands the commoditized food production system. So in this way, it is, it is potentially, you know, we talked about markets, mm. you know, because the popular conception of capitalism is that, you know, the consumer, you know, votes with their dollars in the, in the consumer mm. by changing the buying behavior and the buying capacities and all of these things. It's all about the buyers and, mm. and, and that sort of thing. Markets are run by consumers. Mm. Well, but it might be true I, in this uh, sense. Yeah, in a sense, but I also think consumer demand and expectations are created. So that's true. Uh, it, it's, it's a kind of cycle where things feed into each other. I often take the example of chicken, by the way, because uh, chicken is the chicken consumption is the real rocket in the meat sector globally. You know, the chicken was in the 1950s or something consumed to a very small degree in almost all countries. It was very expensive. You In America, you, they talked about Sunday chicken, you know, uh, as something, you, because Sunday you eat yeah. something that is, is great, you know, chicken. Yeah. But yeah. today, chicken is, is very Everywhere. cheap, staple food. It's even in a Swedish shop, it's actually even cheaper protein in chicken than in beans, which is hilarious. But anyway, and that is so... What has driven this? Well, you could say, of course, that consumers bought all these chickens. Yes, they did. But the reason they buy these chickens is, of course, that the price of chicken has dropped tremendously compared to the price of beef or the price of other uh, comparable products. So, well, is it driven by industrialization of chicken or is it driven by consumers' demand of chicken? Or is it driven by the food industry, which finds chicken as a super ingredient in all kinds of ready-made dishes? Because right. chicken has no flavor. It's not tough like beef, you know. Uh, it, you can season it with Asian style, Texan style, Chinese style. Do whatever style you want because chicken itself, especially at least industrial chicken, it has no uh, identity of its own. It has no flavor of its own. It's just, you know a chunk of processed meat. So I think these, the, the consumer, the food industry and the, the chicken industry and the feed industry, which is the main input into the chicken industry anyway, that's a very strong uh, system that is reinforcing itself, so to say. But I think it's too simplistic to say that it was the consumer who demanded these chicken. Right. Uh, for sure, uh, like also with uh, novel foods coming out, like say oat milk or whatever. Well, that's industrial development. Um, even Steve Jobs said something in a quote like that, the consumers have no clue what they want until we tell them. That's probably true too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Who, who, there were no one out there saying we want uh, you know, smartphones. Somebody have to make and show them, oh, well, right. then what yeah. you can do. Anyway. Yeah, so I, I think all systems that are is strong. So even though I do think that our current civilization capitalist system is doomed in the long term, it has shown that it has very strong self-reinforcing loops, uh, which is both a strength of a system, but ultimately also its its weakness. It's a bit like complexity, because it's it's getting out of control. This this conversion of everything into commodities is ultimately undermining the uh, foundations of, of, of society, I would say, because humans are not commodities and society's function cannot be reduced to uh, goods and services that should be bought, like politicians are bought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's yes. undermining the system because it's the system is not built on a total commodification of all aspects of human life. But right. the, the drive in capitalism is the total commodification. I mean, it started with more private school, private healthcare, private this, private that, uh, and everything gets into a market. So it's, it's and the political system is, is well, in, in the America, I think it seems to be almost in the market already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that, that, that's for sure um, from 
most all perspectives that I've been able to witness. Yeah. It, it does seem to be true. It, it, have you read, um, this is not pleasurable reading, I doubt, for somebody like you, neither for I, but uh, George Monbiot's most recent book, um, Regenesis. Yeah, I did. I did read it. Uh, I did read it, yes. At, at the end, um, towards the end, he argues, and I don't want to mis misquote him, and so I was looking to see if I had it close. I, I don't think I do, the book. But he says something to the regard of uh, one of the more dangerous aspects of modern society is uh, uh, poetry. Yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly the quote, but I, I know. He says something to that regard. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It, because he has really taken a stance against all this romantic small farmer, uh, romanticizing right. nature uh, stuff. Uh, I think he was better when he was. Uh, focusing on being an anti-capitalist he did that job <laughs> well but with this modern uh, Monbiot version he's actually folding in quite neatly with the capitalists in, in his vision for you know microbial food proteins and stuff like that which certainly right. will be controlled by by big cap capitalist exactly. companies so of it, course, it if, the alternative like is, if, if the alternative is only capitalist, large-scale uh, pork factories with 100,000 pigs, I don't, I don't have any feelings for those industries. And I can uh, certainly agree with everybody who, who objects to that one. But the thing is that he doesn't differentiate between those and any other kind of uh, animal farming. It, it actually, he's even saying that the worst thing is grass-fed beef in his view because it's it uses too much even worse than, than poetry i mean yeah yeah, yeah 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 it's, it's really bad. <laughs> it's really very bad organic grass-fed beef is the worst thing you can do and i mean he doesn't say it but basically he says that all the pastoralists of the world can go to hell they have no future their cultures are destructive he doesn't dare to say that, but it's implicit in, in what right. he says, actually. All from the Sami of the uh, Scandinavia to the Maasai, or, uh, they're all pastoralists. Right. And they are grazing animals. Yeah, how dare they? Yeah. They must, they, they must not understand methane. <laughs> yeah, <No>. yeah. <laughs> let, no, 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 don't let's start talking about methane. I, 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 I've done a lot of that, but I don't. We, let's not go in there. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I I like. Um, yeah, there's a there's a certain bit of romance that this this beauty seems to require. Yeah, though. Yeah, you know, and it it, it could be overdone. I, I I can see Mambio's point to some small yeah. degree, yeah. but it's a small degree. In order for me to think something is beautiful, it must be romantic. Mm. Yeah. And even in that romance, there has to be a little bit of self interest. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, they don't have to be uh, uh, contrary or, or enemies in any way. So, yeah, that's really interesting. It's an interesting place to land. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do we do? Yeah, that's we what I, I sit out I and mean, write nature poetry, maybe. Yeah. No, I I don't know because I I. I don't. I don't have faith in in uh, markets for sure to fix this stuff, and I don't have faith in uh, you know modern technology uh, to clean things up. And uh, so I lately I I I I have come to think that we uh, uh, it, it, it's more about culture. Of course, we have to change the systems as well because I would say that the. Uh, the modification system and the market system is extremely strong in reinforcing its own paradigm. So to some extent, you must break that or put yourself beside mm. that or make yourself independent on that in, to some extent to change your mindset. But of course, in order to do that, you must have already changed your mindset a bit. Otherwise, you would have no motivation to try to break out of it. So I, I think, but in some way, this very strong system, you need to uh, throw in some spanners in it or walk out of it, or in some way, you know, reduce its grip on you. But in the meantime, we also need to nurture 
those other relationships or kinships or uh, in my last book that I wrote together with my wife, it's not unfortunately not in English, but it's called The Living. We, we land in, in a discussion about gratefulness, thankfulness to food, to nature, and the idea that maybe some things should well be sacred in one way or the other. I mean, because we as humans, we are so, we are powerful. We can't run away from the fact that we are a very powerful species. We have right. given ourselves enormous tools, enormous abilities, and self-restraint is not one of our strengths, I would say, although there are people like, uh, you know, uh, monks and others who, who uh, uh, exercise that. Um, but so as a civilization, we may have to give ourselves limits if nature is not giving them strongly and, and swiftly enough, we may have to make our own limits, which people did before also, I think, implicitly and explicitly by having things that were taboo, for instance. I think that was uh, in many cultures a way to uh, reduce over-exploitation or some other use of other uh, species or, or a mountain or a tree or whatever. Uh, we we may, my, may have to go there again to see other things as sacred in order to respect them and leave them be or let them live or whatever. I don't know if they, if that's, maybe that's poetry. <laughs> but maybe the poetry we need. Yeah. yeah I, d I definitely don't agree with Mambio. See, but no. the interesting thing is, it's interesting that he does pick on poetry because poetry is the only medium of the written word that I know of that can take very simple ideas, very simple words, the best poets, three, four letter words is all they mm. use. Mm. And convey something that is so much bigger than any other medium of writing, mm. literature, novels, stories, mythologies, epics, mm. prose could ever have accomplished. Mm. And uh, it just requires time. It requires time and sitting and pontificating and unpacking and quietness. And what well, to me, those are all things that are, you know, also surround that this idea of sacredness. Mm. And so to some degree, the poem forces you into a very sacred place where you look at a mm. word and it's a very short, humdrum daily word and all of a sudden it becomes a ceremonial masterpiece. Mm. You know, that's that's the power of poetry, I think. Yeah, I wish I had books. that ability. I, I, I must admit that I, I, I tried not to write, but to read poetry. But my, I, I, I think I ruined poetry by training fast reading as a child. You know, I was mm. obsessed by this idea that I should, you know, make 80 pages in an hour or something like that to process as much information as possible. It kind of ruined my ability to read poetry. I just skip <laughs> over things, you know, try to extract as much as possible yeah. in a very rapid way. And I, I haven't come over that. Maybe if, when I get a bit older, I will be able to enjoy poetry because I understand the value of it theoretically, but I have not yet experienced it with mm. my heart, I would say. Mm. Culture yes. is important and, and maybe poetry is the highest art form, but I can't maybe. feel that yet. But maybe. Well I when it happens, them. yeah. It'll it'll be the right time. Yeah. What else, my friend? Anything else in your heart and your mind that you would like to discuss? Oh, well, there are so many things, and I'm quite talkative, as you may have noticed, but uh, I think we covered quite some ground. Yeah. I'm, uh, maybe your last reflections? Could no. End this, this? It, it, it's always wonderful talking with somebody like yourself who has seen so much and has thought so much. And, and, and in your books, um, especially Garden Earth, that I got to read uh, more explicitly than I did the other items that you sent over um it just it just calls to this this deep sense of nuance that when agriculture arose it didn't solve problems it didn't not create problems it just existed and now it's up to us to figure that out mm -hmm. and then the machine and fossil fuels like there's nothing intrinsically negative about you know decaying ancient earth into black goo 
You know, the, oh. you know what oh. I'm trying to say? Like, there's nothing implicitly negative with so many of no. these aspects. Oh. But it's the nuance and how we interrelate and how we perceive uh, our control to be how we you know, actually start to utilize that ability of control. It, it Again, nuance and complexity. And it's a wonderful reminder, especially in view of limits. Um, limits, you know, it's 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 both a popular and unpopular subject. Mm, it um, is. But to envision limits as an intrinsic force that even when you feel like you've broken beyond them, you are still contained within them seems to bring this idea of limits into a very divine sense to me. Mm. I'm not saying it is a God. What I'm saying is it's very similar to our relationship with this sacred source, this God figure, that it is always going to be there. And no matter what we think we can do to it, it still stands beyond that. Yes. So it's both humbling and also exciting because it's mm. like the sooner you realize that you can't extend beyond them, the sooner you're going to learn to live inside of your own limits. Yeah. yeah. You know? So anyways, those are the thoughts and images that are playing in my mind. Thanks to you. Okay. So I appreciate you. If um, I don't like to assume that you want to be found, but if people were to find you in your appropriate medium, is, is Substack? The way people should interact with you yeah that's uh, that's uh, for english speakers i think that's the easiest way and uh, people can email me on gunner at growlink.se if they want to that's fine also but wonderful that's good. and uh, your substack beyond sustainability a garden earth beyond sustainability garden the, earth beyond yeah, sustainability yeah. good good we will put the link in the show notes thank okay. you again thank for... you for being here. It is, uh, like I said, it's a rich blessing and I, I really yeah. enjoy these conversations and uh, I thank you for sitting. And thank speaking. you for, thank you for having me. Okay. <laughs>